Soaring Society, and I own the world's record for a glider for the shortest time from 38,000 feet to the ground. <laughs> The control problem was solved with a simple adjustment, and it never occurred again. The next step was the first powered flight. It was to happen in the X-15 No. 2, also fitted with the makeshift engines. On September 17th, the X-15 was fueled up with liquid oxygen and alcohol for a flight that was not to exceed twice the speed of sound, or 60,000 feet. It was to be conservative and safe. Flight preparation began in the early hours and continued through to daylight. Several powered flight attempts had already been aborted because of problems in the fuel system or the auxiliary power units. This was a highly complex airplane. Extreme care had to be taken at every stage of the process. The morning was cold and damp. The strain of delays and aborted flights was felt by everybody in the crew. Like all the rocket-powered planes since the X-1, the X-15 was a potential bomb with its explosive mixture of volatile fuels. Crossfield had an agreement that in the event of an emergency, the X-15 would be dropped to avoid potential loss of life in the B-52. When the B-52 finally began to taxi toward the end of the runway, all systems appeared to be operating as planned. Hydraulic temperature, Scott. Minus two, and holding since we passed the tower. Chase planes were a crucial factor in the safety of experimental flights. Joe Walker was a NASA test pilot, and Major Bob White represented the Air Force. Both were designated X-15 pilots who would take over when North American fulfilled its test contract. The X-15 would be more thoroughly monitored in flight than any other airplane in history. All available technology was utilized to track every action of plane and pilot. The white rectangle on the underside of the X-15 is frosting in the shape of the fuel tank caused by the low temperature of liquid oxygen. Inside the B-52, the X-15 is carefully watched as the countdown continues. Every aspect of the plane's operation must be checked before launch. The X-15 is dropped. Crossfield fires the XLR-11 engines. He ignites all eight chambers. The X-15 is under power for the first time. Got eight of them going. Roger. Heading uphill at 33,000 feet. Roger. Looks good across the board. And I'm on number one in climbing through 35. The first power flight went well. Of course, I knew those engines very well, and I knew what to anticipate from them and how to make them go. I must have over 100 flights with that LR4 to 11 engines. The second flight went well. The third flight, a problem that had been lurking in that engine for 30 years showed up. And it was just, it, it just took a coincidence of a fraction of a second in things not sequencing properly and it blew the back end out of the airplane, and that's when I put it on Rosamond. When Crossfield heard a fire warning, he began to jettison fuel, heading for Rosamond Dry Lake near Edwards. But when he hit the lake bed, the remaining fuel made him nose heavy. The airplane broke just exactly at the loads that it should break, and it was due to a nose wheel problem. 
on that flight. So there was two separate failures that day, one in the engine and one in breaking in two. The back of the plane was completely broken, but within three months, it would be flying again. By March 1960, the big XLR-99 engine was ready, and reaction motors delivered two of them. One was installed in the number three plane, which was delivered to Edwards for static tests. On June 8, 1960, it was placed in the static test stand for its first firing. Scott Crossfield was in the cockpit. It's always very interesting, you know, that I get in the airplane and everybody else gets in blockhouses, you know, that's what they call uh, building the confidence of the pilot. <laughs> The blockhouse was a shelter for the ground monitoring staff, and on this day, they needed it. Well, I've always said it's the biggest bang I'd ever heard, and it blew the center part of the airplane, not the center, the cockpit and the instrument bay, forward about maybe 20 feet. And we calculated probably it's about 150 Gs and I got a sore neck out of it, and I do believe that's what happened to my eyes because it was some two or three months later I began having difficulty seeing it at night, you know, as it, when your eyes are dilated. It wasn't the fault of the engine. A pressure relief valve failure had caused the liquid oxygen tank to explode. The only effect on Crossfield was the change in his eyesight. And that's why I began wearing the dark glasses. You know, all fighter pilots wear big watches and dark glasses, and uh, nobody thinks much of it. You know, I couldn't see. <laughs> and I sure as hell wasn't going to tell anybody because that would cost me the program. By early 1960, NASA's Joe Walker and the Air Force's Bob White were in the final stages of their preparation to start the government's test program. Scott Crossfield had made his only powered flight in the number one plane in January 1960, flying it to almost 1,700 miles an hour and 70,000 feet. He appears to have enjoyed every second of it. Looking real good from back here. And they look very good across the door. Back in the saddle. But it was Crossfield's last time in this particular saddle. After the flight, North American handed the number one plane over to the government. In June 1960, X-15 number two was delivered with the XLR-99 engine. By the time it was ready for flight testing in November, the program had been running for more than a year. At last, Crossfield could fly the X-15 as its designers intended. I flew over the speed range and demonstrated that the engine could be started and stopped and that it would accelerate and the fuel would scavenge and that the throttle ability was there. I was limited initially to Mach 2, but there was no way you could, you could hold it to Mach 2 by contract. And so they let it out to Mach 3. And I, the first flight that they did that, I, I pushed it so the Mach meter went past three because I wasn't about to let anybody claim that one. And that never was published. <laughs> After two flights with a big engine, Crossfield had done his job. He had proved the plane on behalf of the contractor, North American. The X-15's vast potential was still to be explored. And I, I nurtured secret hopes that I could bring it back to the committee and do the research program. But that was, uh, I knew that maybe, you know, once you quit the club, you're not going to be brought back in. And uh, I had deserted the ranks, so to speak. And also, uh, it would have not been good to have a one-man airplane. We were trying to demonstrate that this was technology, not, not, a, not a stunt and that sort of thing. The number three plane, rebuilt after the explosion in the test stand, emerged in late 1961. It was designed to specialize in high altitude flights and featured a control system that automatically transitioned for flight inside and outside the atmosphere. The first two planes in the hands of Joe Walker and the growing team of NASA and Air Force test pilots had by this time broken every existing speed and altitude record. Joe Walker had flown the number one plane at 3,900 miles an hour, and then Bob White pushed number two past 4,000.
On April 30th, 1970,